Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dearly Father, we thank you for the time of worship we were able to have today. We thank you for the truths of those songs, that, that we were singing songs, but we were also singing scripture. We were singing promises today, God. We were singing about the worthiness of Christ and how he will fix what needs fixing, that, that this broken world will be cured, that, that there's a solution, God, to our mess. That's part of what we sing today. Lord, as we, as we look at your word today, would you make us excited about the fact that you do hold the solution to what is broken, to what is hurt, to what is needy. And that we get to be the bearers of that good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's our slide again. I didn't get one out that, that highlights evangelist, but we're actually in the third pillar, the one in the middle. And the one in the middle says evangelist. And what we've been doing is we've been going over the mission of the church for the past few weeks. We started by talking about what the mission of the church isn't. Uh, the church's mission is not specifically to meet the expectations of Christian people, that somehow we have special Christian needs as Christian people, and that the mission of the church is simply to meet those needs and make us happy. That, that isn't actually the mission of the church. It's also not about making money. It's not a profit-making organization. Um, nor is it an institution of, of human social care. Our, our purpose isn't just to take care of the poor, although it is part of our mission. It isn't just to make government better, although that could happen as part of a church, but that isn't the mission. The purpose of the church, according to Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, is this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And we were challenged that that is a mission for all of us. That's not a mission for a few key people while the rest of us just kind of attend church and soak up whatever we want. This is our mission. All of us. And I promised that I was going to help us understand how we could do that. How we can do that together. How we participate together to make that happen. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the apostolic aspect of the mission. An apostle means a sent one, someone who was sent. And so we looked at that mission. It has to do with the go part of the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. Go into all the world. That part of the mission is the, is the apostolic part. Both as churches and individuals, we need to be deeply involved and invested in supporting and praying for and, and being emotionally invested in. And when people come back, sharing with people and supporting them individually, prayerfully, that front edge of building churches, of spreading the kingdom, that's an essential part of the church. In fact, it is, it is one of the most essential things we can think of when we talk about what is the mission of the church. And so we should be involved with that, even though we're not the ones necessarily going we should be supporting the ones who are going. Last week we looked at the prophetic aspect of the mission. That kind of goes with the, lo, I am with you always part of the statement. If God is with us, if that's the thing, Jesus said, I'm going to be with you. Why would he be with us if it wasn't to give us instruction or empowerment or guidance or something to help us do the mission? Why even promise that he's going to be with us if we don't listen to what he has to say? And so the prophetic bit isn't, isn't any more complicated than realizing that for us to achieve our mission as a church and as an individual in the church, I've got to keep Christ and the Holy Spirit in me and that communication line flowing so that I can continue to get instruction of what to do. Otherwise, what's the point of him being with us? And this week we're going to look at the third aspect of our mission, the evangelistic mission. We look at Ephesians 4.11, we can read that passage again. 
Ephesians 4.11, it's a short verse. It reads like this, And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Let's just be honest. There's some people in this room right now that as soon as I said, we're going to talk about evangelism, your stomach slipped down about two feet. You don't want to talk about this, and you're really not interested in sitting for another morning hearing about how you're supposed to go tell other people about Jesus again. You wouldn't say that out loud, maybe, but that's what you just felt when you heard me say, we're going to talk about evangelism this morning. Why? We're going to get to that. But here's a personal appeal from me to you. This is a, an, an ask. Please do not shut down now. Hang in there long enough to hear what the Bible has to say on the topic. And maybe by the time we get to the end of this, your dread of this topic won't be quite the same. So hang in there, please. I'm asking that. Don't shut off yet. One of the things that we've been doing so far is we've been taking these concepts and we've been trying to strip away what we think the concept means. We've been trying to get down to the essence of what it really means. We're going to do the same thing today. I don't know many people at all that have a clue where the word evangelism or evangelist comes from. It didn't start out as a religious word. We need to understand that, that the words that the people right, who wrote the Bible, when they had to pick words, they had to pick words from their culture that were already there, that were being used to describe something. Evangelism is just the same. It didn't start out as a religious word. Here's what it started out as, and this is actually really interesting. Imagine this. Imagine, this is just one example. Imagine there's a battle going on. And one nation has won the battle. And it's fantastic news. And a messenger is selected to race home to the governor of their country, of their people, and tell them that the battle was won. Okay? He's running, and he goes home, and he's excited, and they didn't think they were going to win, but they did. And it's really exciting because they thought they were going to lose. And then they get to the king or the ruler or the governor, and they say, you won't believe it, sir. We won the battle. We won. And he delivers that message. The word evangelism comes from the gift that the receiver of the message would give the messenger for having delivered that good news. And everybody's like, what? That's where the root word comes from. It was the name of the gift given back to the messenger after the receiver received the good news. Let's just break down that scenario a little bit and give it some words that we know. The messenger left with good news. The word for good news is gospel. So, in the original language, the messenger left with a gospel. They left with a good news message. So, the messenger had good news. They raced with that good news to someone to share it with. And then evangelism came to represent that interaction. It started with just that gift back. But over time, it came to represent the actual delivery of the good news and the joy for both parties at having received that good news. Evangelism was the moment of the delivery of the good news. Now here's the thing I'm going to guess. If you're in this room and you're one of the few people that when you think of the word evangelism, you actually think, I have a fantastic message. It's so exciting. And I'm going to get to someone and I'm going to deliver it. And they're going to receive it in joy. And I'm going to be so happy that they did that. And this is going to be the best experience of my life. If that's you, you love evangelism. Who wouldn't? But if when you think of evangelism, you think... I have annoy, an annoying message that when I deliver, I will either be ignored or maybe even punished for saying it out loud. You likely dread evangelism. And your perspective of what you think of that word has everything to do with what you think is going to happen when you do it and the message that you think you have.
So if I'm going to try to persuade you through the Scripture to be excited about evangelism, we're going to have to look at these pieces, parts, and see if we can break it down a little bit. Because here's the problem. I think we need to fix evangelism. I think we need to fix the process. Because if the process wasn't broke, we wouldn't hate it. But the very fact that we hate it means that it's not working. So we're going to break this down into the elements of that picture. The first element is the news that the messenger was supposed to bring. That it was supposed to be good news. So let's make sure we're actually carrying a message that is good news. Here are some messages that are not good news. Here's one. You should join my club. It'll only cost you 10% of your income. You'll get to sing once a week and hear a kind of a nice message that'll maybe make you happy. That's not good news. That's sales. And you know what? We can make the music better or the preaching better or make more programs for the kids and we can make that deal a better value. But that message just ends up still being selling a washing machine. How good of a value can we make church? That's not good news. That's a business tra transaction. And I don't want to be a salesman. And when I talk to people about evangelism, I feel like we often get the impression of salespeople are good evangelists. What we're doing is sales. If, you're doing it, what, if what you're doing is sales, you're not doing the right thing. This isn't sales. Sales isn't good news. Here's another one that is not good news. Here it is. You're a terrible, horrible person unless you do exactly what I say. You will always be a terrible, horrible person. That's not good news either. It's not good news at all. That's religious condemning news. The Pharisees had a version of that news. So do Muslims and Mormons and Buddhists. There's a lot of versions of that news. You're a horrible, terrible person. And unless you do exactly as I tell you, you'll always be a horrible, terrible person. That's not good news. Here's how Jesus described the good news he brought. We already read it to the children. It's from Luke 4, 18. Luke chapter 4, 18. This is what he said. I've read it once already. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to speak good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, setting free those who are downtrodden to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. There is no sales there. There's just provision. There's no demand for the person to change or get better or to be worthy. It's just provision. It's just Jesus announcing, I've come to set you free. Period. Dot. End. I have come to set you free. That is good news. That's fantastic news. But we can confuse the good news we're bringing for something else that isn't all that good. And so if our message becomes something that isn't good news, the, the whole process dies at the very beginning. It dies before we even get started. If what we're bringing isn't actually good news. Not only that, unless you believe you actually have good news, you'll never tell anybody at all. Why would you share? Here's the thing. If what you have Here's what you have. What, if what you have is I have habits and traditions that I do because they make me feel comfortable and my parents did it. And my parents kind of bought into this internal uh, insurance program where uh, they get to go to heaven when they die. It's kind of the family tradition to stay with that insurance program. And so uh, I've just kind of stuck with it. If that's what you have, that's nothing. That's not good news. Again, why would I try to convince you that my traditions and my insurance program and my, my past values that I just got from my parents, why, why would I try to sell that on you?
If you think church is boring and you think being a, ch church, being a Christian equals going to church, why would you tell anyone to be a Christian? But if you know that Jesus transforms broken lives into something amazing and beautiful, then you have something supernatural to share. There are far too many people who call themselves Christians who see their religious affiliation as something similar to, I don't know, having brown eyes or, or being a fireman. Who are you? Oh, my name is John. I have brown eyes, brown hair. Uh, I like to go fishing. Um, um, uh, I'm for the eagles. And uh, I belong to the Christian faith. You see, it's just, it's just part of the description list. If that is what Christianity is to you, you need to hear the gospel. Because you don't understand what it is that we're doing here. You still need to hear it. If that's what you think Christianity is. Jesus wants to totally restructure your life, forgive you of everything you ever did wrong, put the Holy Spirit of God inside you to communicate it to you and empower you every day through God to you, set you free from everything that has ever enslaved you, make a citizen of an eternal kingdom, and turn you into an eternal being of light that will never die. If that happens to you, that becomes the central point of everything you are. That changes your entire identity. That is the center of you. Everything else is just details. That's a different message than I joined a religion. Some of us don't have any enthusiasm for the good news because we haven't even experienced the good news really we've only experienced one version of a religion that isn't good news so if we're going to be excited about sharing the news we need to make sure that we have experienced the very news that we're supposed to be trying to explain After looking at the gospel message itself and trying to define and explain what it is that it is that we're trying to share. And understanding that that would be fantastic news if we were sharing with people that eternal, powerful, life-bending message that is totally good news. Then we have to consider the audience. Let's go back to the example of the messenger. So we've got the battle. There was a war. There was a fight. The messenger ran one direction to go tell the governor that they won and they would be excited. What if he went the opposite way? What if he went to the losing team? Do you think they would think it was good news? It's certainly good news to the messenger. The messenger's from the winning team. But if the winning team messenger still goes to the people who aren't at all interested in hearing it, he's not going to get a very good reaction. You know, there were people in Jesus' time that flocked to hear his message. Thousands and thousands of them. And there were people who hated his ever-living guts for his message. Jesus proclaimed his me message publicly, and it was the potential to be good news for everyone. But many people who could have been transformed by it hated it instead. The most obvious group of people that hated it was the Pharisees. I'm going to talk about them specifically. The Pharisees were the religious rulers who were controlling Israel and who were trying to get all the people to do good enough so the Messiah would come back. That was their goal. They had a strategy and they just had to get all these crummy, bad, sinning people to quit sinning so that Jesus could come back. That was their objective. I have to tell you that the message of the Pharisees was directly opposite the message of Christ. Jesus brought good news to the poor. The Pharisees brought rules and criticism to the poor. Jesus came to release captives. The Pharisees collected sinners and made them into captives. Put them in prison. Jesus came to restore the blind. When the Pharisees encountered blind people, they asked, Who sinned, them or their parents? You deserve that blindness. Live in it. 
Jesus came to free the downtrodden. The Pharisees heaped more and more and more rules on people already overwhelmed by rules until they were totally just gave up. I can't do all these rules. I just, I must be gross. The Pharisees created downtrodden. They not only thought that they didn't need Jesus' message, they felt as if those receiving Jesus' message were undeserving of what they got. And that Jesus had no right to offer it to those creepy, bad people. So they hated the good news that Jesus brought. And you know what? I could go through and exhaustively read it. You can go look for yourself. Jesus did not spend a massive amount of his time trying to convince the Pharisees they were wrong. They had encounters. They were often and usually initiated by the Pharisees and Jesus reacted. Jesus spent his time with the people who wanted to hear that they could be rescued. He spent his time with the people who desperately wanted it. Look, in this world, there are many, many, many people who do not know that Jesus is the solution. Okay? But those people are divided into two groups. One of them are people who know they have a problem, but they don't know Jesus can solve their problem. That's one group of people that don't understand that Jesus is the solution. Here's the other group. The other group is perfectly convinced that they are great the way they are. Thank you. They don't need any help. See, to those who know that they have a problem, the the barrier is believing that Jesus could possibly help them. The barrier is thinking this is too good to be true. The barrier is, I, I know that my life is totally a mess. I'm having a hard time getting my head around that God could reach into my life and change this fix this. I'm too broken. I'm too messed up. My addiction is too strong. My problems are too big. My debt is too large. My grief is too hard. I can't do it. I don't, I don't, I'm struggling with this idea that God could be enough. That's their barrier. But to those who are convinced that they're already perfect, Jesus is simply an unnecessary complication. Why would I add that? I'm already sufficient. And you know what? You can't change that. Jesus didn't manage to change that in people. If Jesus couldn't change that in people, we should have no expectation that we can change that in people. Now, God can. And God can reach into the hardest heart and soften it if that's what he chooses to do. But we cannot. Jesus was killed by the people who didn't appreciate his message. So don't be surprised when the people who are ready to hear about Jesus are broke, addicted, convicted of crimes, abused, or an abuser, emotionally destroyed, abandoned, physically damaged, socially unacceptable. Don't be surprised when these are the people most ready to hear the gospel. And the sad thing is, is that oftentimes as a church, they're not the people we want. We want pretty people. Who are doing nice. Oh, those people could really contribute to our church if they became Christians. We want financially stable, successful people who will tithe well. See, we are broken in our view of who the message is for. And I'm not telling you that God can't save successful people. My life is not characterized by broke, addicted, convicted of crime, abused, abuser, any of those things. And God saved me. Okay, so you don't have to be ruined for God to save you. I'm not saying that. But I will tell you that the people in those very difficult groups, they're the people who know they need saving. They're the people who know. And I'm just going to put it out there. They're the people Jesus was known for spending time with. Tax collectors and sinners. The socially outcast and the spiritually destitute. And, the, and how many people did Jesus work with who had been demon-possessed? Oh, who's in your church? Oh, well, about half of us used to be demon-possessed. Oh, that'd be a selling point. But you know what? That's the people around Jesus... So 
don't be surprised if your message of good news is not received well by everyone. And if you're constantly only sharing your good news with people who think they're already perfect, you may have the wrong target audience for your message. I mean, don't stop telling them, but really, we need to go find people who know they need Jesus and tell them there's an answer. The last piece of the picture is the reward received by the messenger. And again, this is a massive difference between some of the people in this room and most of the people in this room. There are people in this room that know, because they've done it, they know what it feels like to sit across the table from someone who is sobbing and broken and hurt and to share Christ with them and to watch their life change. There are people who know and, and watch them walk out of that and their life be changed. And then it doesn't just change their life. It, it, it changes other people's lives. And it impacts their kids or their husband or their friends. And then they grow up and they have these, these amazing ministries and you're blown away. Some of us know that reward and some don't. Here's how Paul explained that feeling. Ephesians 1.15 he says this, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ which exists among you and your love for all the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for that while making mention of you in my prayers. Here's what Paul's saying. I was there. I went to Ephesus. I witnessed to you. I knew who you were. And when I hear of what you're doing and your walk with the Lord and the change in your life, it just keeps filling me with joy over and over because I knew what you would have been and I knew where you were going and I see God's glory in you now and it's just the best joy ever. It's a gift that never stops as you watch this person through their life changed, delivered, rescued, different. And it will not end in eternity because you will see them there and you will know you are there because God worked through me to share the gospel. And I know that. And I get to live through eternity knowing I shared the gospel with you and here you are in heaven. That, people, is a reward beyond anything else I could really describe to you. And you see, if you've experienced that, I don't have to tell you. You already know. But if you haven't, I'm trying to convince you. I have to try to tell you that that will happen. I have to, I have to try to share with you and, and get that in. But to tell you what, the first time that really happens to you in your life, you'll go, oh, that's why this is so cool. There is a gift received by the sharer. And it is a good gift. It is the natural consequence of the joy of seeing a life saved and restored by God. And you get to watch. And it's the coolest thing ever. You see, if we believe in our message and we understand that our message isn't selling religion or tradition but that we're bringing news salvation deliverance and change that isn't dependent on what we do it's just a gift from god he's ready to fix you and forgive you and restore you and make you into something totally different and we bring that to the people who in need who know that they've they're broken and their life is messed up and they don't know how it gets fixed and you bring that message in and then we get to watch them transform into something beautiful and different and amazing. You know what? There's nothing to love, not to love, about that process. With that complete picture then, if that's what we're all supposed to do, then why is there an, a role of an evangelist? This will go pretty quick. Evangelism is something every Christian can and should do, but some are specifically gifted. They get supernatural direction. Remember last week we talked about the prophetic aspect of this. God is, a, we're supposed to be living in a condition where we're sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is urging us to do. And you know what? He doesn't all urge us to do the same stuff. 
We don't get the same type of direction exactly the same as everyone else. It's specific to what God's role. And an evangelist gets really good direction about who to share the gospel with. Not only that, they sometimes actually get word-for-word -word instructions on what to say in that situation, and it's awesome. Not everyone has that gift. All of us can share that message, but not all of us have that gift. In leadership, an evangelist never lets the group forget the importance of constantly bringing the good news to people. Typically, the people who need the good news aren't at church already, which means that we need God's prophetic guidance on what ways he wishes us to use and bring the good news outside the church. So once again, an aspect of this pillar is personal. We, we have an evangelistic responsibility individually, and not just evangelism as, as a responsibility, an opportunity, a, a, a gift, a, a glorious opportunity that God gives us because he loves us and he wants to share that moment with us. But there's also an organizational aspect. As a church, we need a strategy to devote resources to this goal of making sure that we have opportunities to share this message with the world. And both of these are essential to the Great Commission. We cannot make disciples until we have changed people. This, that's, that's the start of this. You, you, you don't have disciples. You don't even start the whole teaching them to observe all that I've commanded to, which we're going to get to in the coming weeks, which is still an important aspect of what the church does. But we don't get there until we have changed people. This needs to continuously happen in the church. So what do we do with this? And this is how we're going to close. First of all, do you know the message of the gospel? Have you responded to the message of the gospel? Is, have you changed? Are you, are you a changed eternal being of light and dwelt by the Holy Spirit who communes with God, who knows you're forgiven, who who knows you live forever with Christ? Is, do you know that? Or do you belong to an institution that has specific beliefs that if you check these boxes, uh, someday you, you won't have to stay in the grave? Those aren't the same thing. Understand our audience. And don't take it personal when there are some who don't recognize that they need saving. Jesus faced the same issue. But understand, there are tons of people out there that know they need saving. If we're willing to talk to them. But they're quite often the people we don't want to talk to. Three, participate in organizational events with an evangelical objective. When we talk about as a church that we should have things that we plan whose purpose is to bring this message to people, help. Help physically help with prayer help with money if that's what God asks you to do participate in the evangelistic efforts of the group even if you're gifted in evangelism it doesn't mean you can't help make it happen four utilize those who do have gifts arrange tea with your friends and an evangelist invite the evangelist to your social gatherings that includes people who need to hear the gospel. Why? We're a team. We don't all do the same thing equally well. So plan on doing things with the people you know who need to hear the gospel with this person who seems massively gifted at doing that. Last, let the broken and the needy and the hurt into your circle. They are often hard work. They often are demanding, but they're often also the most likely to know that they need a Savior. And the fact of the matter is, many times, we reject people who are the exact folks that Jesus came to save and rescue. And we decide that they're too dirty, or too messy, or too drunk, or too abusive, or that their language is too foul, or that they don't bathe enough, or whatever it is we decide, and that we won't spend time with them when they're the exact people that know they need a Savior.
Evangelism is an essential part of the Great Commission. It's not the only part, but it doesn't happen without it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we consider the mission, Lord, is it, I just have to ask, Lord, if there's someone in this room who, who identified more with church being an institution than with salvation being a personal life-giving experience, I am, Lord, would you, would you work in them right now? Would you challenge them internally? Would you make them thirsty and hungry for something more than just a tradition and a building that they show up to every so often? Would you make them hungry and thirsty for a personal, intimate, powerful, life-changing relationship with you that will leave them never again the same? Would you make them starving for that? Starving enough that they will ask, how, how can I do this? What does this mean? How do we get there? Lord, maybe we need to be reminded that that's who we are. Even if we've had that experience, Lord, have we forgotten? Has this magnificent, life-changing thing become mundane and normal and boring? If so, then it's little wonder we don't have any enthusiasm for sharing it. Lord, would you speak to us through your Holy Spirit and give us wisdom about who to share with? And Lord, would you convict us? Would you convict us of the people we shut out? Do we decide we, someone else can share with them, not me? Lord, as a church, would you help us to strategically and clearly and plainly make plans and obey your direction as we consider how we can organizationally reach Exmouth with the message of the gospel. And that this would never be a factor that we ever forgot or diminished or decided was too hard. As it is the essential heart of what we do. And we thank you for who you are and we thank you for being, for those of us who have received this, Lord, we cannot ever quit thanking you for the transforming power you worked in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.